Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The symposium will begin momentarily. Please take your seats. The symposium will begin momentarily. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The symposium is about to begin. Please take your seats. Good morning. Please welcome to the stage the Heard Museum's Dickey Family Director and Chief Exec Executive Officer, David M. Roche.
Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Jeff just said, my name is David Roach. I'm the Dickey Family Director and CEO of the Herb Museum. And on behalf of the trustees, the staff, and the Volunteer Guild, I want to welcome you to the Remembering the Future Symposium. I want to uh, just quickly take care of a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, uh, please turn your phones to silent. Uh, photography is per permitted, but please uh, turn off your flash. The restroom, restrooms are outside in the foyer and to your left, so through that door. Uh, and if you need to leave the auditorium during the session, please do so quietly and mind your chair uh, squeaking as you get up. Uh, I want to start, of course, with a big thank you. Um, thanks to all of you for being here today. Thank you to our distinguished panelists and moderators. We're so looking forward to everything that you have to say. We want to thank the Terra Foundation for supporting today's symposium. And I want to thank the entire HERD staff for the wonderful job they did in organizing this. In particular, uh, Diana Pardue and Anne Marshall, uh, Dan Haggerty, Jeff Goodman, and Alexis Stanley. Um, so thanks to, to all of you. Uh, we're going to start the symposium with a land acknowledgement, the Herds land acknowledgement, which was authored by Dr. David Martinez, who is a panelist uh, as, uh, with the symposium. Uh, we are fortunate to have Roshai Montano. Uh, Roshai uh, is uh, a, a former Mellon Fellow at the Herb Museum for two years, and she's currently an assistant registrar. Roshai? The Herd Museum acknowledges that the land this institution has stood upon since 1929 is within the Otham Javed, which the Akumal Otham have regarded as their homeland since time immemorial. Despite the land's annexation into New Spain, the Mexican Republic and the United States, which assumed control after the 1854 Gadsden Purchase, the Akumal Otham have consistently asserted that this land is theirs as recounted in their creation story in which Javed Makai, Earth Doctor, made this place. Today, the Akumel Atham are part of the four southern tribes of Arizona, which is a coalition comprised of the Gila River Indian community, the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, the Akchin Indian community, and the Tanhana Atham Nation. The Heard Museum in what is today downtown Phoenix, Arizona, occupies land within sight of numerous Hohoam or ancestral Atham canals, farmlands, and villages, which is evidence of a presence going back countless generations long before Father Eusebio Quino and conquistador Juan Mateo Mange arrived in the area on November 21st, 1697, which harbingered a succession of colonization. Indeed, the founders of the Heard Museum in particular benefited from the US making Arizona a territory in 1863, then a state in 1912, which led to the economic development of Phoenix, which became an election precinct in 1868. Consequently, the Heard acknowledges that it has a moral obligation to the Akamil Atham on whose land this museum continues to thrive. The latter is in addition to the indigenous people from within and well beyond Arizona currently inhabiting the greater Phoenix metropolitan area. With this in mind, the herd proclaims that it remains dedicated to honoring its relationship with the Akamil Atham through its programming, exhibits, public events, publications, and community service which it extends to other indigenous peoples represented in its collections. The, her the herd hereby proudly commits itself to a future of building, improving, and nurturing its relationships with the Akumil Atham and other indigenous communities locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. Thank you. So 31 years ago, 
the Herb Museum opened an exhibition called Shared Visions, which looked at uh, Native American artists, painters, and sculptors of the 20th century. Uh, as part of that exhibition opening, we hosted a symposium called Shared Visions. Um, and it was such a fascinating um, uh, dialogue. There's a transcript for it and one that I refer to often because so many of the issues that were raised 31 years ago are still relevant today. Uh, one of the key participants in that symposium was Rick West. Um, and Rick West has graciously agreed uh, to join us 31 years later to be part of this symposium. Um, and we thought we would start off with just a little bit of a, a Q&A uh, between uh, Rick and myself um, to see, you know, uh, what's been going on over the past 31 years. So, Rick, please come on up. So the bios for all of our panelists and moderators um, are in the packet that you received. Um, Rick almost needs no introduction. Uh, he uh, was the founding director of the National Museum of the American Indian and most recently the director of, of the Autry. Um, Rick, I wanted to start um, with this question. Uh, You've been the director of two major museums. You've also been a partner in a blue chip law firm and started your own law firm with a group of other indigenous lawyers. What qualities and skill sets are needed by museum directors and curators today to build the 21st century museum? Well, I guess you, you have to be willing to get into a lot of good trouble along the way. <laughs> um, I guess that's what I would say. And I, and I must say that it is, uh, it is a great joy for me to be back here 31 years after, um, as uh, I am now 80 and then I was in my 50s, uh, because lots of things have happened in, uh, in that span of time. I think for one thing, from the standpoint of museums and what they do with respect to native arts and collections and that kind of thing, uh, there has been an absolute sea change. Uh, it was almost a benefit that I came from outside of the museum community, honestly, to be the founding director of the National Museum of the American Indian. I, of course, was grounded in the fact that my father was a native artist and a very active participant in the Oklahoma fine arts movement of the 20th century. Uh, but I arrived with a certain set of expectations that I wanted to try to achieve and the board wanted to try to achieve that affect the questions you're talking about. If you lo were looking at the three things the NMAI tried to do, they were these. The first was to get rid of the notion that Native peoples have no capacity for interpreting themselves and their own culture. And so that resulted in the injection of the first person voice into interpretation and into everything we did. And the fancy word, I suppose, that, that, that pertains is that that was a huge epistemological change. Um, it, it just had to do with who was saying what and who was allowed to speak and what authority was attributed to their voices, all right? The second was that whatever the NMAI did, it would look at Native cultures and their creativity, their art, their objects, etc., as a dynamic phenomenon coming from a deep past and going on to an indefinite future, uh, which we would insist upon, quite frankly. Third, it was that the NMAI, located in New York and Washington, D.C., would figure out a way that it brought itself to Native communities. That would be very, very important, too. Um, we didn't expect anybody would ever think that Native culture actually turned on what happened in Washington, D.C. and New York, that it happened in the communities where these cultural communities existed. So that, I think, had a great deal to do with curatorial interpretation. Uh, it has changed. It's been revolutionized. 
um, the first person voice has been injected into the curatorial process of most major museums interpreting art and interpreting native objects, and that's absolutely key to what has happened. Um, and I will say that, that it's not just a question of what happens at the curatorial level. It also has, is affected by what happens at the top of the museum. And I will say that one of the proudest legacies I have at the NMAI is having generated an entire new generation of native museum directors. Everybody from Patsy Phillips at Mokna, uh, at the Institute of American Indian Arts, uh, Jim Pepper Henry, who has been here and now is at FAM, the first Americans museum in Oklahoma City. You need a push from the top in order to accomplish things that have deep impact upon curatorial approach and interpretation. Thanks, Rick. So 31 years ago, uh, the, the title of the panel that you moderated was the Native American Fine Art Movement of the 21st Century. Mind you, this was 1991, so it was still the 20th century. Um, tell me, what do you think are the headlines of the past 31 years uh, regarding the movement? Well, the headlines, I think, are very, very significant. Um, and they're completely transformed and changed. Uh, one of them has to do with what we just discussed, and I won't repeat that. There has been just a, a sea change, an almost 180 degree turn in how museums approach the very subject of interpreting native objects, native culture, and native art. Uh, the second is that I think now, even much more than then, uh, there has been another revolution. The herd was always a leader in looking at the possibility that what natives produced and created could have a number of different labels attached to it and could be looked at as art. Contrast that with my dad, who was primarily an artist of the middle 20th century and later 20th century, who spent much of his life trying to get off the walls of natural history museums and onto the walls of art museums. Um, that was not an easy task, and he spent the better part of his life trying to do that and ultimately succeeded, along with lots of other people who deserve to have the tra same transition happen for them. That is thoroughly accomplished at this point. I don't think that there is any, any museum in this country that will dispute the fact that native creativity in the form of art, visual, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, what have you, uh, has its place in the category of art. But one thing we may come to a little bit later is we need to look at that fact, be happy for that headline, but sort of remember in the long haul some of the distinctions that exist, if you will, between native creativity and native art and that which comes to us from other continents. They're different animals in certain respects, but we can get to that in a moment. I do want to mention to everyone, if you haven't had a chance, uh, the current exhibition of the Grand Gallery, Remembering the Future, includes many of the highlights from shared visions. Uh, so uh, some of the pieces that we'll probably be talking about today, um, you can see in person uh, in the Grand Gallery. My next question for you, Rick, is uh, during the Shared Vision Symposium, there was a focus on the approaching millennium. Um, was that as big a turning point in the field of Native American fine art as people thought it might be? I think it was, but I think there was already considerable momentum in hand. And I would analogize to the creation of the NMAI itself. Uh, there's often the question asked of me in reflecting upon that happening, which occurred at just about the same time as the Shared Vision Symposium. Well, what was going on? Were we thinking of the year 2000 and the next millennium? Well, yes and no. Uh, we were thinking of that, but there were certain changes that were occurring in American society as a whole that, that I think were a big push on that. Um, 
there, there was the, the, the multicultural movement in, in American culture and in looking at American history that came out of the late 1980s and, and early 1990s when communities that had been systematically marginalized and pushed to the side and whose cultures had been pushed to the side or unrecognized were saying, no, we're not going to do that anymore and we're going to insist on our being included in this great tapestry that's called American culture. And so that, that was a movement even beyond the NMAI, it was a movement even beyond contemporary modern and contemporary native fine art. And, and so there, was, there were fundamental movements, if you will, uh, in society which were also pushing in the same direction. And I think that it was a certain kind of confluence of events, if you will. Uh, the NMAI sits in its spot on the National Mall uh, because it was a time when for a number of reasons and factors people finally recognized that perhaps those who were here and had been here a long time before those who came should have their own page and their own thread in the tapestry of American culture. And, and uh, I think that that had a big impact upon what happened with the recognition of, of native fine art as being uh, something that deserves some kind of recognition. And of course, that headline has gone on to other places, which we also may talk about in a moment. One thing that I was struck by in reading the transcript for Shared Visions was that there wasn't a lot of discussion about technology and the role that technologies might play in uh, future uh, in indigenous art. How do you feel about technology? <laughs> well, I, well I, I embrace it in many respects, but I want it to be kept in a certain place, and I don't want it to become a replacement something for other things. Um, but what I would say is this, is that uh, I remember a good friend of mine who is not here, but whom I've known through the years, an artist in his own right, Rick Hill, uh, who is Iroquois and was on my staff, my original staff at the National Museum of the American Indian, saying, um, our tradition, and he was speaking of native life and native art, our tradition is innovation and change. Well, you look at that and say, well, what does that mean? You know, I mean, you're, you're sort of defeating the first part of what you said by the last part of it, but no. I think that, that, um, that native people and native artists refuse to be assimilated, but they are adaptive on their own terms in ways that are significant. That's been true in art. I mean, my, my dad's thesis at the, uh, at, the, at the University of Oklahoma when he got his Master of Fine Arts, and I think I'm not mistaken in saying that he was the first native person to ever receive a Master of Fine Arts from the University of Oklahoma. Um, his thesis was about the confluence, if you will, and the engagement between European modernism and, and, and traditional plains painting, which is how he grew up. But he went other places. So this is to say, um, don't be afraid of technology, really, but keep your eye on what the real ball is. And it's not necessarily technology per se, but it can be a means to another end where native art is involved. Fascinating. Thanks, Rick. Yeah. I've got two more questions for you. Mm -hmm. The next one is, in the past several years, there has been a push to incorporate Native American art into the narrative of American art. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, funny you should mention that. Um, <laughs> the, uh, that that's, that's an interesting question. I noticed that one of the folks, he may be one of the speakers, but I know he's in the audience, John Lukovich from the Denver Art Museum. I happen to be a member of the board of the Denver Art Museum at the present time. And uh, not too long ago, had my sort of, each time we have a meeting, John and Dakota, the, the native, native, native curator who was there, and I tried to get together, and we were talking about that. So here's what I would say. Um, I never feel that something like art should be ghettoized. And so I think that we should be unafraid of exploring other kinds of connections and, and external engagements. Uh, so in that way, I take some heart in the fact that Patricia Norby 
now sits as a curator and a native curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I truly do. And there is a way in which we need to be included, I think, in anyone who is trying to look at American art history. At the same time, I want to be sure that it is on our terms, not their terms. I'm not interested in necessarily in our being included in the collections of major and encyclopedic American art museums if they are simply trying to take our creative, our creative output and put it in their historical boxes of academic norms for what constitutes American art history. Because we come to it with our own set of particulars and ours are different. And I think I might as well just spin out what I mean by that because it's something that I would like to talk about the, with the panel uh, that I'm moderating that follows. And that is that, that native art is, is a different animal. It, 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 it does have aesthetic power and beauty by anybody's standards. There's no question about that. But native artists have a dual role. They are not only artists per se, but artists, I think, for us, are the major culture bearers for the, for the native community. Have been since time immemorial and still are. And I would not want native artists now, brilliant as they are, wherever they're engaged, national art market, international art scene, to forget that responsibility to the, to the native community itself. Thanks, Rick. My last question. 31 years ago, you asked James Lavador, Kay Walkingstick, and Truman Lowe, what will or should the influence of the art market be on the future developments of the Native American fine art movement? How would you answer that question today? <laughs> well, Turn around is fair play, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that, uh, you know, they wrote the script. They provided the answer themselves, uh, all three of them. Uh, there. They're all three um, very close friends, and, and they wrote the story, which is to say they chose their own path, and they did not let the expectations of existing external art markets determine what their creativity was. And I will say that I have seen, with no names named, um, instances where others have sort of shaped, if you will, the path or appearance of the artistic creativity of, of, a, of a native artist. And I think that's dangerous and it is, it is untruthful. And, and all three of those artists uh, that you name and whom I remember so well and still know and knew Truman, Truman worked for us actually at the NMAI chose their, their own path of, of creativity. And um, that may or may not at various times have coincided with what the expectations of the national art market or the international art market may have been. But in the end, everybody is the beneficiary of that, I think. Non-natives and certainly natives are the beneficiary of that because it, it it somehow keeps the, the, uh, the ongoing cultural thread and relationship of native art to native life vibrant, alive, and true. Thank you, Rick. I'm going to excuse myself, and I'm going to invite the panel to come up. Okay. And I've got to go get my folder. <laughs>
Well, good afternoon. And uh, here's what I'm, I'm going to do. We, we are time constrained here. Um, and uh, so we will try to move ourselves right along. I will give uh, no introductory remarks for myself. I've already been introduced. Uh, I will read one thing more uh, before we actually uh, get into the uh, discussion itself. What I am going to ask each of the panel members to do um, is to give a brief introduction of themselves uh, before we go on to the questions and uh, some of the matters that we would like to address. Uh, some of the panel members have uh, slides or visuals. If they would like to use those in the course of uh, introducing themselves, please feel free to do so. We're trying to be sure that we have, uh, we're geared up to, to raise those uh, slides if we need to. Uh, but here's one thing that I would uh, like to read that pertains to one of the last things that I said and sits, I think, uh, near the core of what Native artists do. Um, and it's, it's interesting to me because uh, one of them is a quotation from a person I refer to, Rick Hill. Another is a quotation from Bob Houses, who was actually with us uh, this weekend. Uh, and the first is, this, uh, is, is Rick Hill's comment. When he said, the main difference between Indian and non-Indian artists is that we are still community driven. Art is the cement that binds the Indian people together, uniting us with our ancestors and with generations yet to be born. Through art, we can take a look at why language is important, why ritual is important, why land is important. And then the quotation by Bob, uh, and this, was, uh, this quotation is from a series of consultations which were held at the time that we were forming the National Museum of the American Indian. Way back at about the same time, we were having the first Our Shared Vision Symposium. And Bob said, I want to see people participating in my work. That's totally contrary to what we're taught in America. The artist is an individual, the genius. I don't want to see that in my work at all. I'd rather see, at the most, a cultural reflection of of being Apache. I've been fighting these concepts of individualism, uniqueness, and universalism, concepts that are totally contrary to tribalism. Individualism denies a future or a past awareness. You claim it, you own it, but you're not part of it. So, not that anybody has to respond to that immediately, <laughs> we'll get to it. Uh, but please, Brian, if you would like to say a few words and then just work down the, the line, if you will, an introduction. Sure, thank you, Rick. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Vallo, and I'm from Acoma Pueblo in New Mexico. Um, I just want to say that I'm very happy to be part of this symposium and here with such a great group of um, panelists and this amazing man here and all of the other panelists who are scheduled to uh, be part of today's and tomorrow's program. Um, I, I don't really classify myself as an artist. I, I'm a tr I try to be an artist. Um, but I've, the works that I've been engaged, I have um, always attempted to promote Native art and culture uh, while also working hard with others to safeguard our resources, our cultural resources, our sacred lands, our sacred landscapes, our languages, um, to ensure that our people continue, so that the arts can continue and everything else that comes along uh, with it. So I uh, am very happy to be here this morning and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Pete? Nyawes kainot swagwego, onandawaga niya, I give thanks that all of you are well this morning. Uh, our language is Onandawaka Guano, the language of the people of the Great Hill. I come from a community called Cataraugus in English. 
uh, got that guess gale in our language. And uh, I have responsibilities within our ceremonial way of life as a faith keeper. I, I mentioned that in uh, my introduction. But for 34 years, I, I managed a Seneca historic site known as Ganondagan, the site of a 17th century Seneca town and uh, 569 acres of land in uh, 2015. We, we opened uh, Seneca Art and Culture Center, about a $13 million project that uh, took me a number of years to raise the money and, and see it get built. Uh, prior to that, we, we reconstructed uh, a full-size Seneca Bark longhouse, and that uh, took some time, too, to, to happen. Uh, I retired in February of, uh, of this year, and uh, to devote more time to my art career, which has always been kind of in second place as I uh, did all this administrative type things, including repatriation, et cetera. But um, right now I'm uh, really focused on my art and I, I made the right choice. Good things are happening and so I'm, I'm just going with it. So Donnie Hodiai. Thank you, Pete. <clears throat> Tony. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Tony Abeda. I'm uh, from Navajo Nation and I am uh, alumni of the Institute of American Indian Arts. I'm a painter, and have been, and I have experimented with doing jewelry and sculpture, uh, a great many other things. Um, I am honored to be here today to talk a lot about, you know, the climate of, of really contemporary American Indian art. And uh, I'm really a student of not only, you know, world art history, but specifically, of American Indian contemporary art, historic, and I, every day it seems to be part of the discourse of what goes through my mind when I'm thinking about it. and so for that, I really uh, am passionate and love talking about, you know, what's transpiring in, in, in the art world. And, um, and in between that, I, I paint, and I'm a father of two kids, and um, you know, I love traveling, so it's good to come out here, get away from the rain in New Mexico, and get some sunshine today. So I'm looking forward to, to dialoguing with everybody today. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, here, here's the first question I would ask, and I, I realize that uh, each of you comes at this from a slightly different angle. And oh, let, let me also point out that I, I prefer that panels like this function, as, even though we're lined up. Function is, is sort of a conversation, you know. It's not a not a series of set pieces by each member of the of the panel, but kind of a conversation amongst ourselves. But here, here's one question I have, and it's it's in knowing each of you as I do and have for a long time, for the most part, uh, and and seeing the different ways in which you come to art. Uh, there's Tony, who was at it from the very beginning, schooled in it, pursued it all of his life. Pete, who was there, but has kind of focused on other things along the way, um, but now is more focused on, on art production. Uh, and it may have been that the things bound up together always in any event. And, and, Bri and Brian, who uh, professes not to be an artist, but he is an artist, and he's dealt with it in an institutional complex if you will, context, if you will, as, as a museum director at ACOMA. Um, I'd, I'd love to know, sort of, as you have evolved, but go back to the beginning for a moment and, and share some of what, what, how you thought of the subject of Native Fine Art at the very beginning and what place you thought it had in how your life would spin out. And any of you can start, and if one of you doesn't, I will tap someone. <laughs> um, I've given some thought to it, so I guess I'll just say what I, what I wanted to say. Um, before the National Museum of the American Indian, there was the Museum of the American Indian called the George High you know, Museum of the American Indian. And uh, two friends of mine worked there, and they decided to do an exhibit of contemporary Native art. This was 1971. And they chose uh, Fritz Scholder, uh, George Morrison, Neil Parsons, Lloyd Oxendine, and myself to be the first artists to show there. And um, 
So that was the first time I really showed in a group show with other Native artists. And then uh, Lloyd Oxendine opened up an art gallery in New York City in a place called Soho. For any of you who are familiar, it's in Manhattan and uh, south of Houston Street. And uh, Lloyd asked me to be, a gallery, to be a member of the gallery, you know, show my work. And, and I wound up uh, helping him curate shows, uh, install shows, travel shows around uh, the Manhattan area. And, uh, and from that point on, I decided, you know, I was going to continue to show with other Native artists because I felt I really related to them. I met people like Larry Avacana and George Longfish and uh, a whole host of other people, Oren Lyons and, and so forth, Duffy Wilson. Over the years, you know, there just kept being more and more people that I met. So that was when I kind of made that conscious decision about 1972. And then there was an article in Art in America, I think it was called 23 Contemporary Indian Artists, if I remember right. And Lloyd Oxendine wrote that. And uh, he had full uh, free reign to write what he wanted. They published what he wrote. And uh, I was one of those artists in that article. Tony. So my father was a painter at the Santa Fe Indian School in the 30s. And he struggled most of his life to make a living in art. And um, I never thought that that was the direction I was going to take. I, I worked in movie theaters. I tore tickets. I started the projector. I watched movies. It was like I grew up in Gallup, New Mexico. That was my hometown. And then the opportunity, my, one of my older sisters incited me to consider going to art school in Santa Fe at then the Institute of American Indian Arts. And it never occurred to me, wow, I'm going to be a painter, that I'm going to be up here talking about art that I'm going to have a painting in the gallery, in, you know, in, in this museum. It really just happened as a process of, you know, doing the next thing. I, I went to art school. I found a passion and love for, for doing art. And it became like just, you know, it was, I was so passionate about it. Like I just loved being in the studio. I loved the smell of paint. It was like it was innately what I was built and meant to do. When that happened, and then I got to look and see all of the other artists at the same time, and I could go to their openings, and I used to go to openings, Elaine Horwich with Fritz Shoulder, and I would see Charles Lolima there, and I'd see Earl Bish drinking, and I could high-five him and shake his hand. And, and so I got to know the whole uh, pantheon of American Indian artists and art and go to the galleries and... And so just as this young kid who was trying to figure out like, you know, how to mix colors together, get physicality on the canvas and experiment with sawdust and paint and things of that nature, it was a really exciting time for me. And that's, that's really how I kind of entered into this conversation of, you know, how, how does my personal experience with art, it was in, in the beginning an escape to get out of my hometown and then what ended up happening became this huge discourse of, of other artists and creativities and visions and intertribal connections between all kinds of amazing people. And now, like, you, you know, the world that I exist in is, you know, really part of, like, a lot of my heroes. Like, I get to, like, go through that next gallery and, like, I know this person, I knew that person, I, you know, have a painting by that person. It, 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 it does this to me, you know? I, do, I just love this experience of being an artist in these times and watching the continual progress of what is transpiring even, you know, today. Um, Brian. Brian, I'd, I'd ask the question a little differently to, to you, which is to say, um, you know, you do come at it uh, from a number of different points but one of them is sort of uh, from an institutional point. In other words, there, were, there was all kinds of art in front of you as a museum director. And how did, uh, where did, where did that begin? And, and this is an interest in native art, very much like uh, Tony and Pete's, uh, but you know, from a slightly different place. And, and tell me how you, you looked at it and, and attached importance to the subject of, of Native art. 
Thanks a lot, Rick. I was ready to answer it in the first form of the question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, you know, one of the things for me is that um, I've always been drawn to things of beauty. And my, mater my paternal grandmother was a potter. She never called herself an artist. Mm -hmm. um, my grandfather sewed moccasins, made drums, but he didn't consider himself an artist. And many people in my community who are creating beautiful things would not call themselves an artist. The first time I heard, I can distinctly remember someone identifying themselves as an artist was the late Emma Lewis Mitchell, mm -hmm. the daughter of Lucy Lewis. And she was so, she was a striking Akama woman, you know, very beautiful and very social. And um, I asked my grandmother one time why she didn't consider herself an artist because I mean, you're just like Emma Mitchell, you're like Lucy Lewis. <laughs> uh, and she, she says, well, in, in our language, she asked me, well, think about that word, that Medigan word, that white term artist or art. And she told me, we don't have a word for art in our language. So I thought about that and it stuck with me and I, again, just kind of always referred then to this beauty of creativity within our community this creative spirit gifted to us um, as just a, a, a just a, it's almost magical, you know. And, um, and then much later on when I uh, started dabbling in some uh, painting and making pottery, even while my grandfather was very opposed to me touching the clay because it was a, that was for women. He discouraged me um, and told me I should you know, he would actually tell me, go chop wood, put that down and go chop wood. And I would go march by it outside and <laughs> chop wood. Uh, but I was always drawn back to that place where my grandmother was making pottery. And, and I, because I was around so many old people in my youth and hearing these incredible stories uh, about our ancestors and our, our history, I always thought about what my ancestors were creating. And later in my work, I discovered that this creative spirit of our people goes back so far. And I find myself in this time, and as a museum director, working to understand how this creative spirit has evolved over time. And I'm trying to understand also how these items created by our people have ended up all over the world. I just returned from Minneapolis, um, well, not returned, but I arrived here from Minneapolis on a re review of um, a collection of about 1,500 items, both human remains and their associated funerary items. And to see the beauty and the items that were placed with our ancestors and their burials was just, you know, it makes the hand stand, stand on your arms and neck. And I'll just say that my work has been and will continue to be, I hope, focused on under, better understanding these, these connections and this evolution and this creative and beautiful spirit of our people, many of them who are here, many of you are in the audience, that is just really shifting and growing and expanding and influencing change. And um, you said earlier in your remarks with David how artists are kind of the keepers of this knowledge and traditions. Well, they are. And I, I really have a great respect for that, that creativity. 
thank you. So that is, that is a, from all of you, a wonderful description and approach of, of, of the what. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to push a little bit on the why. And I want to uh, focus first, if you will, on the external. In other words, outside of the native community. Um, and then come back around what you've just signaled, uh, Brian, on the inside of it. But um, Pete and, and Tony, uh, the joy of, of uh, individual creativity is profound. And uh, it's wonderful to watch it. And I was reflecting while you were talking, Tony, on the fact that my dad, my dad knew your, your father. Narciso, Abena. Um, and, you know, they came out of a very particular era, which was kind of a struggle if you were trying to be a freelance native artist. But, but I'm, I'm interested in the why. When, when your creativity goes elsewhere and Pete or Tony is in a show, what, what is it that you really hope people will take from that? What, what are you trying to get them to see? Is it, of course it's aesthetics, it's beauty, but, but in your own mind, what, what are your aspirations for, for their experience in, in this? Um, uh, well, I'd like to show some of my sure. slides. Go ahead. If, uh, if those people over there can put up some slides. I know my, uh, some, some of my work is, is not, well, there's one. This is a painting from about 1985, and uh, it really, you know, what I was thinking about here was um, the situation for the, for the bison, digiatgo, we say in our language, was, uh, you know, a diminishing land base. I, I heard a story last night, I think it was on uh, radio, on TV, that the herd got down to about 24 bison. And that they came back from that to, to what you have in Yellowstone and what Ted, Ted Turner owns and all the rest of them we own too. So, so uh, you know, it's, it's amazing that they survived at all, given the onslaught to destroy them completely. Well, anyway, I guess I was thinking kind of about that, you know, with the ideal in the top and then sort of the reality in the bottom of the, of the piece. And I'm hoping that people kind of just think what is this thing about? What is, what is the artist talking about? Uh, and because I don't really, you know, know. Uh, when I hear people tell me what they think my work is about, uh, I'm always surprised. <laughs> so, so, but sometimes they see more than I do, and uh, and that's good. Uh, after, after a while, you know, you, you sort of develop. Um, I don't know exactly what it is, but you can kind of, and I know Tony knows, you develop this thing where. It's almost, in a way, prophetic. You're doing work that you don't know about yet, but you're going to learn about it once you get this thing done. Um, I don't know how to explain that otherwise, but it, you know, it, it's a great blessing when it happens. It doesn't happen all the time. When I mean, you had an idea, right? But in the process of trying to do that idea, it didn't come out exactly the way you thought of it, but it might have come out better than the way you thought of it because you, you came up with something in the solving of the of the artwork, and, and, it, and it made more sense. Um, I'm going to let Tony talk some more, because I'd like to hear him. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I've been fortunate to be around a great many storytellers, right? Just people in my family, the way they tell stories and friends. And I, I reflect on how that, for me, was important in dialoguing about things that were going on internally with me as an artist and um, let's see uh, so this is a, a large-scale drawing and um, it, it's called I think it's titled Bird Sanctuary and it was this idea a lot of these big large-scale drawings were were done with the idea that so I, I have, you know, I was raised in Gallup, New Mexico, and then I went right to the Institute of American Indian Arts, and I went to like one city to the next city. Now I'm like this total urban Indian, you know? And, and for that, it was, what is my, you know, native experience with connection to, 
you know, the traditional source of where I come from and who I am, and then the journey that I've always been. So, so much about the artwork was about, you know, connecting to that source, and then also, what does it feel like, and how can I tell this experience of it in, in, in my own unique way? And so, like, this is like birds in this chaotic, very frenetic, almost, you know, like street art kind of wild style, you know, drawing in the way that I tackle a piece of paper mounted on canvas. And it, it was chaotic, it was um, frenetic, there were so many things happening. And that's like a lot of, you know, really how my life is. Like I, I'm, you know, jumping on planes, I'm going to one place to the other, and I just devour like these experiences and everything happening. And, and I say yes to everything. And as I get older, I backpedaling and try not to do that as much. But that's why I think painting became so palatable for me because I was able to tell this story and, and, and how does it feel? And I, right now I'm engaged in, um, you know, the American landscapes. You know, I'm, I'm working with, with just the landscape as my, the subject and how does that, what is that experience? What does that have to do with being native? And what does that have to do with, you know, my personal experience? But it is sanctuary. It is a connection to this source, the land, and also to tell the story of like its magnificence. And also the idea that it might not always be like that, you know? In 10 years, things could change, you know? The climates are changing. And then what is this experience of the here and the now? It's the one place that I, I hold very sacred is just like watching and looking and eyeing and saying, my God, this is really amazing. And so it, it has been authentically the direction that I've kept focus on, you know? And simultaneously, I've been wanting to do a lot more things, you know? Do, video and I want to get back to jewelry and I want to build things, deconstruct things. I, you know, my brain's constantly thinking about the alternate Tony and it's just that, you know, idea of like, what is with the time that I've got, you know, what do I, what do I, what, I, what can I keep this focus? How can I create the <clears throat> most effective story that I can tell? And that has always been challenging. I think for artists, it, it is one of the things that we're constantly battling between, you know, how do we, you know, there's so many great narratives and stories to tell. How do we begin to, you know, focus on one or the other? And um, I, I'm, I'm all over the place. I do these big giant black and white drawings and I do um, <clears throat> jewelry and I, uh, I've done some video work and I've also, you know, the, you know, landscape, modernist landscape paintings. Um, I don't know if that's really the, 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 the question is, you know, why do I do it and how did this happen? I just, you know, find, like, I don't know, I was really lucky. I was really fortunate because I didn't want to do this. I didn't really want to be a painter. I thought there was some alternate life for me, but I was so lucky that I just got put into this one place that it was almost divine orchestration because I love it. I love this experience in this lifetime. And I often tell people, I'm like, this is, you know, the idea that in this lifetime, this is the one thing that I get to do. I get to be a painter. Another lifetime, I get to be a musician. But in this time, I get to be this guy. And, and it cha it's challenging. And some days, like, you know, I wake up and I think, man, I'm, I'm going to hit the studio and make a masterpiece. And other times, I think I'm just going to make a mess. And, you know, maybe I should go to the thrift store. But um, yeah, I'm gonna send it down. No, no, you, the way you need not worry. You, you both are speaking to exactly what I asked. But if if you happen to have, do you have other more slides? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Each of you, if you want, pull up something else too and do the Can same. Can you guys thing. run some more? Because there's some there that uh, I think they'll surprise maybe or. Oh, this is the most recent one. Um, you know, they built, a, uh, they built a canal across New York State. It's called the Erie Canal. And when that was built, it disrupted all of our territories from the Seneca, the Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and Mohawk uh, as it went across New York State. And, uh, you know, we were displaced by cities and roads and all the development that came around because of the Erie Canal which they consider, they, I'm sorry, 
a, 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 an engineering masterpiece, you know, and, and it did bring a lot of commerce to the interior of the state from the Great Lakes. And then uh, things went out of the Erie Canal and out into the world. And um, so what I, what, kind of what I was thinking about here was the way the mule, which hauled these uh, canal boats along, replaced the snowy owl, replaced the otter, replaced the, the black bear, replaced all these things because of the, they took down thousands of trees. They created this invention that could tear trees down and they just chopped them up and you know disposed of them, and they turned the forest you know into a, 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 an urban landscape or a country or a town landscape or whatever. And so uh, I was trying to figure out a way to to talk about that. And, and one of the results was, of course, barbed wire everywhere for the cattle that they had. And the other thing was, they they made these cobblestone houses because they were digging up uh, you know these these trenches or creating a canal. And they came up with all these smaller stones, and all those stones got hauled away. And they built taverns, and they built hotels, or boarding houses, whatever, out of these uh, cobblestones. And that's one of the buildings in there. Is a friend of mine used to live in that cobblestone. Um, anyway, that was what this one was about. Is, uh, and it was part of a, uh, a commission I did for the Rochester Museum and Science Center. There's a, there's a companion piece to this that I don't have an image of. Can we see one more or two more, maybe? So this is another recent one. Um, I mentioned that we built a Seneca Bark longhouse. It's a, it's a 17th century longhouse, which is 60 feet long, 22 feet wide, and about 22 feet tall. And, um, and so what we did was we wanted to recreate a kind of building we lived in in the, in the 1600s. And to do it, we also wanted to have their, the trade items that were coming from the French, the Dutch, and the English, the native manufactured items that were still we were still living with, and we're in this transition period with Jesuits wandering around and, and trying to get rid of them, and you know all these things are going on. <laughs> and, and, and when we created a, a, a garden in front of it, which is a traditional garden, corn, beans, and squash, we call them the Wen on Dan on De Joheko, they sustain us, the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. And, uh, and it's a woven, actually it's a woven fence that I didn't really follow through and create. Uh, but all these birds live in my backyard too, so so you know I like to uh, welcome the Baltimore Oriole and um, Peleated Woodpecker and all the rest of them that come around. Uh, one more slide, and now I'm going to turn it back over to the rest of us here. Oh, so this is about my father. Uh, this is my dad uh, here on the right-hand side, and uh, my mother and my sister and I standing in front of one of our cars. Uh, my father was an iron worker, and uh, he liked to get dressed up when he wasn't iron working. Put on a suit, put on a tie, you know, and uh, go to a family birthday party or whatever was going on. And uh, uh, he, he got the name uh, from his father, Inky. Not because his hair was black or anything like that. It's because my grandfather figured that my father was going to be able to make a living to support himself. So he called him Inky, meaning income. And uh, kind of, most people don't know that that was the reason. But he had a real green thumb. He could grow so much food and so many beautiful flowers. Just he had a, a knack for doing it when he wasn't, you know, ironworking. He really liked to get his hands in the, in the dirt. And he was also a fisherman. So um, I'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Pete. Do you, Tony, do you have another, any more that you would like to bring? Um, no, I only brought one slide of my okay. work. But, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate all of that because it, it is, um, it speaks to a point that we have, have raised before. And that is what's interesting to me in listening to both of you, um, and I've seen, I had not seen the work that you showed, Pete, but I, I've seen the work that, that Tony showed. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's interesting is that you did not, your remarks included nothing about color, line, composition, blah, 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 as important as that may be, uh, even though they were all notable for precisely those things. Each of them was somehow about a narrative, a story, a piece of substance. Uh, and uh, that is a point that is very important to me when you're talking about native creativity uh, and why, why we do it and what is being done. And it, br it brings me back to a, a, a point that 
you and I have discussed before, Tony, and that is that uh, given the fact that our fathers belonged to a particular generation of Native artists, uh, at that time, and I reflect back on some of my, my father's work, uh, it was very much a period of, of jeopardy and threat to Native culture and native ways and protecting, protecting certain kinds of knowledge. And for that reason, in my case, and I think in your dad's, um, uh, in many, many times, it, there, it, was, it was preservation that showed up on canvas. They were trying to, trying to depict that which needed to be preserved. And that was the source, for example, of my dad's, for which he had to get permission from the Sundance priests, of my dad's four paintings of the four days of the Sundance. And they are meticulous in their detail about it. I mean, there is gorgeous representational work. But it wasn't just for that reason it was done. It was something else. And yet you, both of you, are talking about events historical and contemporary that are important. Uh, you are talking about things which happened historically to your particular communities. Uh, you are talking also about things that go beyond our communities and have impact on others. And you and I had that conversation in connection with the Maloof show that you did in, in, in uh, Los Angeles and what was the subject of much of what the art was that was there. So. It, it seems to me that that is something worth noting about, about Native art. What motivates it, where it goes, what it's trying to say, to whom and why. And I guess, Brian, what I would like to hear you reflect on, which you began to a moment ago, but which I think is important uh, to, to nail the point, and that is looking at this internally, in terms that uh, Rick Hill and Bob Houses were, were talking about in the quotations that I read, it has, it has terribly important meaning to the community from which it originates or to the native people who are, are looking at this art and for whom this art is also done. How do you, how do you measure, as you began talking about a moment ago, um, the, the importance of native creativity and its connection uh, to culture bearing and, and, and whether we really need to be sure that native artists take on that responsibility in addition to their own individual creativity for which we also admire them. Thank you for that question. Um, not too long ago I uh, moderated a panel of four artists in Santa Fe. This was the week following India Market, and I posed a similar question to the panelists mm -hmm. about that idea of responsibility and how their work as an artist is connected to back to community what their art does to help sustain and perpetuate culture and traditions and language from the communities that they come from. And all the artists had some really good responses. Uh, and it made me think more about what we need to do to further advance that idea and really engage our artists and our, our uh, the, especially the up-and-comers and those, those who are thinking about art as careers, but others who are uh, maybe on the opposite side, right? Um, those who are studying law and history, art history, uh, museum studies, because I think we all have a we have, have a role in that, uh, fulfilling mm -hmm. those inherent responsibilities mm -hmm. to preserve and sustain our cultures. Mm -hmm. And I, I think about that often, I have this concern, and I, I hope I, no one is in, um, feels like I'm making a, an attack or, um, trying, you know, being insulting to anyone, but 
One of my concerns is how some of us as artists maybe have and are and have taken very sensitive cultural symbolism, iconography, stories, knowledge, and using that as a baseline for their creativity and presentation of art to the world. Mm -hmm. And it isn't only happening now, it's, it's been happening for quite some time. And I don't think that we've had, at least I'm not aware of any conversations about this mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that as we are losing our languages, which then impacts our ability to really sustain our cultures, we have to be even more protective and more guarded and more aware of our actions as artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe try to find some, a greater balance so that we are not infringing upon, and you know, working against ourselves in protecting and sustaining our cultures. But I, as I said earlier, um, I respect this creativity. And I often reach out to the artists to help, in, not only from my own community, but this artist community that I'm privileged to, to be a part of, mm -hmm. uh, working in museums and living in Santa Fe, living in Ac from being from Ackham and having access to so many artists that I I find myself using them more, mm -hmm. finding ways to engage them in these conversations, finding mm -hmm. ways for them to be engaged in mm -hmm. cultural preservation and revitalization initiatives. And in the museum field, I'm very grateful to see that there is a generation of Native people who are thinking about the same things. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope it shifts some gears for, for us and that you know, we do a better job collectively at um, preserving who, who we are uh, for ourselves and not necessarily for the art market, not necessarily for galleries and museums, but for our communities. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Tony, comment? Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I think as Native people, we, we we have this unique situation where we're really tied to this, the source, like this really rich ritualistic, you know, the origins of, you know, who we are, that are mythological, that are magical, that have, um, you know, in many ways can be sacred. And that there, there is this balance of, you know, the, the connection that we have to that. How do we create our art that's authentic, that is tied to where we come from, what we believe, our rituals, and simultaneously try our best not to exploit that, to be able to create what we create. And, you know, in my own personal journey as an artist, much of the earlier work that I did was based on very much the sacred iconography and belief systems of you know where I come from and my understanding of you know the spiritual investment and all things, but it, as time went on, I realized that that didn't serve the continuity of who I was to be in you know in later years. There was way too many things to explore as as an artist, and but there is that very you know sen you know that that sensitive ground that that we all have to look at it like what is. You know, who are we? Where do we come from? Is it an exploration into our own personal identity? Is it an exploitation of who we are as people, as artists? And um, I often reflect on, you know, you know, my father was a painter and he, you know, came out of, you know, Santa Fe Indian School and, and he painted hunt scenes and he painted, um, 
you know, day out of the life, you know, uh, sheep herders, and you know, you, they're, they're magical. They're so beautiful. They're really wonderful paintings. But later on in his career, he started painting a lot of paintings that were tied to Navajo creation methods, stories of, you know, uh, what we believed of the emergence myths. And then he went on to do a series of paintings that were about uh, witchcraft and, and uh, of uh, skinwalkers. So he was, you know, it's on the cover of Dorothy Dunn's book and it's a skinwalker on there, which at the time, and even today, you know, within Navajo culture, that's like, you know, you don't want to go there. You don't want to do that. But, you know, he, it was what was authentic to him. It was the story that he always wanted to tell because he would tell us a story, you know, in the winter. He would tell us these stories and we'd be like, whoa, that's some crazy stuff. Those <laughs> stories were so rich and part of the narrative of, like, understanding that there was something richly um, deep and meaningful and often on the edge of being somewhat terrifying and magical that that's actually so much of the story of, you know, what he told us, he also felt the need to tell that to the greater world. And I think that there is that balance, you know. I think there is, you know, part of it is like, how do we identify these things? And it's also about cultural values. There are certain things that people will paint that um, uh, other tribes won't you know, that, that they, they will embark upon. In a, in a world of American Indian beliefs, you know, everything's sacred. So it's just like we get to pick and choose, you know, what is, you know, what is the, the, the limitations of what that world means. And I think that's kind of what the dialogue is, some of mm -hmm. this is. And, mm -hmm. and um, I was looking, you know, while Brian was talking, and one of the choices he had was, uh, look like there's an archeologist finding like a piece of pottery and then there's another image of the stuff in museums. And that's the beginning of like, you know, what, you know, the, the traditional ritual connection between the mysterious underground and, you know, burials. And then that emerges into, that becomes the information for all people. You know, what is the private world of the Native American uh, people and what is the, um, what, what is, um, public and what is sacred and and these are the dialogues I think which has been really important I think in Brian's work that I understand what he's working in very much currently is about preservation and connection between what is you know that sacred how do we how do we identify that and, and do we not have these conversations or do we have these conversations but but I think that has everything to do with art because what we are doing as as a as a you know, as people of color, as indigenous people to this land, we have such a rich, beautiful story to tell. And simultaneously, it's, we're also threatened with like the exploitation of it and the sale and the marketing of those, of, of those things, objects or ideas, practices. Yeah. Go ahead, Pete. Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, I want to show one more slide of, of the creation story, if you can find it. Well, this is, a, this is another piece of mine. Uh, you know, they're, they're wanting to build a solar farm uh, near where I live, a town called Avon. But unfortunately, they want to put the solar farm on top of one of our old towns, which also has burials connected with it. And the, the name of that uh, solar farm is called Horseshoe. And so that's why the horseshoe is in there. And I've, I've been using paper bags as a venue, you know, or a uh, medium for expression. And so uh, my grandson had a Lego bag and I thought it was perfect for this, for this story, you know, and the ego of thinking you have all the answers and, and um, you know, don't build a solar farm on top of my uh, sacred site. So anyway, that's what this one is about. And that's, uh, the, the belt is called a wampum belt that was given to us by George Washington, actually. Uh, Canandaigua Treaty Belt, or called George Washington Belt. He commissioned, uh, two Oneida women to make a wampum belt, which we use as a way of, uh, you know, making a, a, an event uh, complete. 10 minutes, I think we got. One more slide, please, because we're on this subject of uh, what is sacred. You guys got the creation story one? You don't have it? Okay. Is this the last one? Oh, okay. Well, there's <laughs> one, I just recently did a, a mural um, on the Iroquois creation story. And then I did a film as well 
on the Iroquois creation story. And I, and I worked with the animation department of the Rochester Institute of Technology, and I worked with a group of dancers called the Garth Fagan Dancers, and our own dancers and singers and so forth. And um, <clears throat> in, in uh, 1899, John Arthur Gibson, who was a Seneca chief, related our Iroquois creation story to a Tuscarora anthropologist named J.N.B. Hewitt. Very long story, of course. <laughs> And, uh, and it was very detailed and had all kinds of, you know, fantastic meaning and imagery. And then um, my cousin John Mohawk took it down to an annotated version uh, called The Myth of Earth Grasper. And uh, so the, based on that shorter book that John did, I created my uh, film, The Creation Story, to, to tell how our world began, uh, you know, from our, from our stories and uh, to, to highlight the, the meaning that each of the characters of the story tell for us. Because in our story, there are two twins, the left-handed and the right-handed twin, that go about fashioning the world that you and I experience. But internally, you and I have these two characters, right? We have these, this struggle between being a good person and being a you know, not-so-good person, right? Or, or being a person who is conflicted, you know, that doesn't have it all together. So I, I've been there, you know, I've been there with all that. So anyway, the, the, but the creation story is, what, what I'm very happy about is that when people, young people especially, our, our young people come to the Seneca Art and Culture Center, and that's the film they see in our orientation theater, our young people will sit and watch this film over and over and over again and go in there and just, you know, lay down on the benches and watch this film. And that's, to me, it's a success because if my own people, my own kids, like the story and, and it's their story and they're into it, then, then I've done it, you know? I mean, I've done what I set out to do and uh, that's all that's important to me because now they'll know that story. Otherwise, I'm not sure they'll know that story. Mm. So, so there's that risk involved of having to tell it even though they're certainly, and I left out the really, really sacred aspects of it, you know? There, mm -hmm. there are aspects that I know I couldn't put in the film and so I just had to make those, make those judgments and, but because I've been grown up in it, I know what's not to be shown and what is to be shown. And, and so I felt okay with doing it. Mm -hmm. Donnie Hill. No, I appreciate all of those comments. Uh, we are uh, getting, I've received the signal and I will honor it that we are drawing somewhere near a close. But since we sit in one, a museum, and your moderator is the director of two in his own history, um, here's my last question, and it can be sort of the, the, uh, the, the swift drill question, and it's this. Um, from each of you in mm, about a minute, um, what have museums done right and what have they done wrong with respect to um, Native art and what they've done with respect to Native art uh, since 31 years ago? We can yeah. start either end. Go ahead, Brian. Let's do it. We'll go that way. I'll start. I'll start. And what I will say is, 31 years ago, my career in this on this path began. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Three years ago, I was appointed to serve as governor of, as of my tribe, and it had been 27 years since I served in tribal government. And one of my first consultations with the museum concerning the fate of some ancestral human remains was that that consultation, 27 years later, was very similar to a consultation I had 27 years prior. Hmm. Same questions. So museums are are being told, I think, more now that you're still missing the mark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The good news is that some museums are listening. The good, good news is that there are some museums that are, who are setting a bar for how this work should happen. The good news is that the recognition of the term art, of items that are not necessarily from a cultural and Native American perspective, not art, 
is being recognized. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a movement here that's happening and I'm really excited about it and happy to be part of it. Okay, thank you. Pete? Um, well, let's see. Do you know, finally, uh, 50 years after I really began my career, um, I'm going to say a few things that uh, I don't want to sound like too much of an egomaniac here. The Whitney Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, um, PS1, and even the National Gallery are uh, paying attention to my art. And uh, that's a first, you know. Uh, I'm going to leave here, I'm going to fly to New York City, and I'm going to do a family workshop at MoMA. And I'm pretty sure that's the first time a Native person has done a family workshop at MoMA. And, uh, yeah. He's Newa. All right. <clears throat> Let's see if I can do this quickly. Somebody use yeah, a timer, yeah. right? <laughs> um, so much has transpired that I get really excited about because um, when I first started in on this, it was just, you know, there were, there were some people who had made you know, you know, a good living. Fritz Shoulder was one of them in TC Cannon, and there was, you know, a show at the Smithsonian of those two as a pair. But since that's transpired, there's been like a really an amazing movement, not only within museums acquiring major works by Native American artists, but like the market of American Indian art has exceeded like TC Cannon's hit way over the million dollar mark. Not a lot of people know that, but it's mm -hmm. true. Fritz Shoulders, you know, bringing in, you know, $250,000, $350,000 on painting. But that's not what's the most exciting part. The most exciting part, can I get a couple slides up of some images? I want to just go through and just show some works that I think are really fun, really exciting. Um, You'll have Nani to really quick. At the site, Santa Fe, just doing... Really what's happened is like the um, explosion of young, uh, diverse, multimedia artists, performance artists. Let's hit another image. Um, Chinupa Hanska Luger, New York Gallery. Most major museums acquiring major great phenomenal works of his. Uh, again, performance and, um, you know, he started off at the Institute of American Indian Arts and I saw his like early works. And, like he's just killing it. He's doing some amazing work. Another image, uh, Nick Galanin. I mean, this, this guy is just, you, you know, doing... This is a deconstructed totem pole that's produced in Indonesia. Like, they forged and faked these, you know, uh, Haida totem poles. He chopped it all up, painted it black. He made it into firewood. I think it's titled... I think it goes like this. He did maybe three or four of this, four of these. And uh, Kent Monkman, who's just, you know, the, the exciting part is that, like, we're breaking down some of these borders of what are indigenous people. Like, Canadian, Canadian Indian, they're still one of us. They're still us. If you're across the border into Mexico, indigenous people, on the other side, we're being more inclusive. These colon, uh, colonist constructions of borders are starting to get more flexibility. Um, you know, you know, non-binary gender artists are creating some of the most amazing stuff ever. It's exciting to watch it, to bear witness to it. And I'm glad to be, you know, watching all of it. It's just really exciting. Thank you very much, Tony. And I will send you forth, if I may, on, with these words in Cheyenne. Um, uh, and, I, uh, and I say this, this uh, to, the, to the panel also, which I thank very much for their wisdom today. The words are these, Nama Hell, Na Jame Vit Sam, Na Ma Jame David Hats Hotel Ohest, Na Sam Khan, Nida Hawaii Sepeva, Janishe, Nishevet. And in English, these are the words Mahel, the great mystery, walks beside you and walks beside your work and touches all the good that you attempt. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our morning session. We are now on a break for lunch, and we will resume at 1 p.m. The Heard Museum Cafe is delicious and open for lunch, as is the coffee cantina, which has grab-and-go options. 
We will see you back here at 1 p.m. and also tonight for our free First Friday event with the Elegant Vessels exhibition opening and artist talks with Tony Abeda and Nora Naranjo-Morse. We'll see you back here at 1 p.m. for the afternoon session. Thank you.